Um, the first thing that I want to do is uh, a, an exercise. So I want you all to stand up. And I want you to put your right hand up in the air. And then I want you to put it on the shoulder of somebody that you don't know. <laughs> and, and now I want you to put your left hand in the air. And I want you to put it on the shoulder of somebody else that you don't know. <laughs> and very quickly introduce yourself. So you've made some new friends, and I, I love events like this just because I, I feel like the energy is in, should be in the center of the room. And there's people on stage, but it's actually all of the things that you're thinking about and working on. And um, you know, I, I'm ex I just get excited for this moment. I'm, I want you all to meet each other. I'm going to introduce myself. I used to look like this. I, I studied fine arts. I studied painting and printmaking. And I didn't use computers at all. I spent all of my time in the print making studio, doing woodcuts, doing etchings. And I had to get a, <laughs> I had to get a job. And at that time, <laughs> at that time, everybody was talking about web design. It was web 1.0, um, Y2K. And all my friends were talking about uh, web design. And so I bluffed my way into a job. And what happened um, was that the economy crashed. We had all this free time at the job. And I discovered at that moment Flash and ActionScript and in particular, this idea that you could write a line of code to make something move. And I had always loved animation, and I never knew how to do it. And for me, that was a real magical moment of being able to write something and see something move. I do media art, and I'm not going to talk too much about the projects I've been doing for about 15 years. But for example, this is a project I worked on called iWriter. We worked with a paralyzed graffiti writer. Um, he's completely paralyzed. He has ALS. We built a low cost open source, open hardware, eye tracking device uh, to allow him to draw graffiti again. Um, I do things like this is a project I did with um, Toyota that has a smart car. And we attached colored dots to it. And we hired a stunt driver to drive letters of the alphabet. And we made a font completely out of driving. I do outdoor installations using the body, projection, weird stuff. This is my friend Daito. We're hanging out working on this project in a hotel lobby in Belgrade. And it must be like 2 AM. We looked really crazy. <laughs> um, so I just want to, this morning I got this message from my wife and partner. Um, I love this message so, so much. Um, so <laughs> this is why I love my wife. Um, so I'm going to do something that I've never done on stage before. So please, um, I hope it goes well, which is I want to show you code. I want to show you the thing that I care about that I use on a daily basis. Then I'm going to show you a bunch of sketches until this clock runs out. Um, but let's open up co the, whoa, OK. But I love this, man. Put a, put a fire under me. OK, so I have an, an app. I'm going to show you how I work. I'm going to make the font kind of big. Grandpa, great grandpa. OK, all right. All right, so um, we, have a, we have an app. I'm going to draw a circle. My hands are shaking. So nervous. OK. 500, 500, and a radius of 50. And this is like the magic, right? I write some text, and I tell the computer what to do. And it's going to be pretty boring at first. I'm just drawing a circle. So I press play. It compiles it. Um, and uh, there we go. Magic of code, right? Tell the computer what to do. Nothing really um, exciting happening yet. But the nice thing is that we can tell the computer to do a lot of something. So I'm going to write a for loop. Hope I do this right. Um, let's do uh, 50 plus i. OK, so now I'm telling the computer to, instead of to draw one circle, I'm telling the, the computer to draw 900 circles. Computer's quite good at it, so I've just made a line out of circles. Now I'm going to mess with it, and I love kind of just introducing math. So I'm going to say float time, get the time, and it's 100 times sine of i times uh, 0.02 plus time. So I love using time. I love using sine. And now I'm going to make this thing look like a sine wave. OK, so now it's animating, right? It's kind of I'm drawing 900 circles. Now I'm moving them around. 
Now I'm going to animate the sine i times five plus time. Wow, I did not consider how my hands would be shaking. <laughs> when I was practicing, I was like, it was like flying. Now I was like, can't type. So now I've, I'm animating the radius, right? I'm adjusting the radius over time. Now let's add color. Um, 127 plus 127 times sine. And I, I don't, a lot of times I don't know what I'm gonna get. I just start plugging stuff in. And, and some of the magic is just kind of um, playing with math. Let's do this. Let's make, uh, let's make red, green, and blue a little bit different. And what I love is just this, this moment of taking text, right? Telling, giving the computer text and changing numbers, changing the equation, and seeing what happens. And I'm going to try to talk to you about what I do. I just wanted to show you what I do. So that was in response to my wife. OK. <laughs> All right. So, OK, so school for, so, yeah. Um, the School for Poetic Computation is a school that I helped co-found with a group of friends five, almost five years ago. And um, we're uh, this alternative school. So for, I taught for almost a decade at Parsons. I have experience kind of teaching in, in this kind of university world. And a, a bunch of my friends got, and I got sick of that, of sick of working in the university. And we decided to start our own school, an experimental school based on poetry and code. And we love the idea of poetry. Because uh, there's a way to describe what we do as creative coding. And I just, I, for me, it feels more magical to say that you're a poet than you're a coder. And I also love in the technology world, there's this concept of demo. But you can flip the words demo and very easily turn it into a poem. And I just think that's, we just want to be creating poems. The other thing about poetry is poetry is always in the back of the bookstore. So you have to go, you enter the bookstore, you have to go all the way to the back. And then there's this tiny section uh, that's focused on poetry. And, Nobody's getting rich writing poems, but these are really beautiful expressions of what it means to be human and what it means to be alive. And that's what we want to celebrate in the school. Uh, so we're based in, the, in New York, in the West Village, and we do this 10-week program where people come to learn about electronics, to learn about code and theory. And in the school, I teach a class which I really love, which is called Recreating the Past. And it's inspired, I love this book. There's this book I found, The Art of Computer Designing. I'm going to get to see my dirty desktop. Um, I found this book, which I love, from Japan. This is from the 90s. And I just, I, first of all, I got into this book because um, of the imagery. So I'm going to like, let's go through it really quick. Um, and it's all about how you can use the computer to do like crazy graphic design, um, these like beautiful visuals. And I, I just love like 80s and 90s kind of graphic design language. And um, there's this section right at the end, this afterword, and there's, there's one sentence that I think is so beautiful. And he's, he's basically thinking, he said, I'd like to acknowledge my favorites, the Russian avant-garde, futurism, Bauhaus, whose brilliant typefaces and designs have shaped my own mind. If the artists of those movements were alive now to work with computers, I'm certain they would discover new artistic po possibilities. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. And I love this sentence, the work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. And, I invite my students to study the past. We look at different artists every week, and then we recreate their work. So in this class, we focus on a different artist or designer. Uh, last week, I talked about Muriel Cooper, who's an AIGA medalist. And she helped start the MIT Media Lab. And she was also in charge of the um, design uh, department at the MIT Press. And, and her work is so beautiful because it's the, really this intersection of code and graphic design. And I was thinking a lot about her work as I was coming here to AIGA. And so we talk about these different artists, and the students learn their work, and then they recreate their work um, as homework. So they have to take one piece. Or the artist Vera Molnar, who's a Hungarian artist who in, um, in the 70s and 80s in France, she was writing code to control a pen plotter and making drawings with software. And so students look at her work and you know, basically reverse engineer it, try to figure out how it works and try to recreate it. Also, John Maida, who's here at this conference, we look at the Morisawa posters, and the students have an assignment where they have to recreate one of these. And we were invited to show the work of the school at a, at a festival. And so I suggested this idea of showing the code and the visual side by side. Um, and we went to this festival. All of our gear said poetic on it. 
Um, and we set up this, basically this installation where the students uh, took apart the work of these artists and recreated them, and we showed the code and visuals uh, next to each other. I'll show you uh, just a quick video. One thing, I'm gonna point, I'll point out a couple things, which is um, we, we sh the way we, c we created it, you would see like on, on the right side where the code was, if one of those numbers changed, you would see a corresponding change in the visual. So the idea is to give you a sense of what code feels like. And people thought we were actually like typing it live, um, so <laughs> which would have been amazing. That would have been so impressive. Um. And I just got so inspired. Um, I, get, I get really get a lot of energy working with students. So I'm going to talk about how that energy translates into my own work. Um, so there was one of the students in the program, Yuki Yoshida, and he created this final project where he tried to study all of the ways that you could tell a computer to draw a circle. And there's a lot of ways that you can encode tell a computer to draw a circle. And I came up with an idea for him, and I suggested it, then I coded it, which is r really um, simple, which is you take a rectangle, and you take one random point along the line of one of the edges, and one random point along one, the line of one of the three other edges, and you connect them with a line. And if that line intersects the circle, you don't draw it. And if it doesn't intersect the circle, you draw it. So in, this, in a way, it's a kind of drawing by absence. And I got so excited about this idea that I, I tried, to, tried it with letters. I tried the word love. That didn't work very well. I tried a smiley face. And I got obsessed with this, and I thought, OK, how do I get those inside spaces? How do I get the lines to go in and show, reveal the forms there? Um, and so I started to experiment with reflection and really trying to um, figure out the algorithms. If you have a ray of light and a wall, how could you calculate how that light would bounce? And just experimenting with kind of using typography and uh, light rays and seeing how they would work, and also uh, refraction. If the light hits the wall, maybe it bends. And the installation that I have here in the uh, Hall B, you can actually kind of, I take those sketches, I turn them into an interactive installation and invite you to come and play. And the thing that I love about this kind of project, so I'm gonna kind of fast forward, this is at the Panorama Festival. The thing I love about this sort of interactive project is that it's quite physical. You come with your body and you see your hands right away, and, um, and you see yourself. Like you, you, put your, you put your hands there, you put objects down, and you see yourself, and the artwork goes from your body to your mind, and then back to your body. And this process of sort of body, mind, body, I find really beautiful and, and captivating. And by the end, people aren't even using the shapes anymore. They're just kind of playing, or like they put their heads down, and um, it's just really fascinating to see what people do. I got inspired by the students in, in the school that I teach at, and I started to do daily sketching about a year and a half ago. And basically, I post on Instagram every day, I make a small sketch. And these are short animations. When I started, Instagram let you do 15 seconds. Now you can do a minute. And I would just post these short animations of just anything that I'm thinking about. And I'll try to explain what, what my motivation is, and I'll show you some examples of this. Um, a, a couple of things that motivate me. Um, I love this uh, Rules for Students by Sista Karita Kent that John Cage popularized. Um, and there, there's a bunch of rules for students. My favorite is rule seven, the only rule is work. And just the idea of kind of just working all the time. Um, and then documenting all the time. So I saw this guy on the train and he has a phone and a camera and the Snapchat glasses. And so he's got like three cameras. And I thought, that's, that's what I want to be as an artist. I just want to create stuff, and I want to document everything and post everything. Um, I, and I have another rule, which is ABI, which is inspired by this. Um. A, B, C. A, oh. always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. And for, for me, ABI is always be iterating. 
always iterate. And what I do is I don't try to make a new thing every day. I iterate. I just take the same sketch and I rework it, and I try to just change it enough that it feels like something new. And it, for me, this iterating feels like a really important part of my practice. I love this. This is like one of my favorite images to describe what I do. This is a kid who had to write, I, I will make better choices. And you can see it at the start, he's writing like, like each letter individually. And by the end, it's like, all, like the stem of the bees are connected. <laughs> and and this, is, this is magical, because this is describing the shortcuts that you need to take. If you just have to do something again and again, you need to take shortcuts. And those shortcuts become your style. And that's something that I'm kind of fascinated with. So I was doing sketches. I was doing sketches with reflection. And it started because my... Um, my stepdaughter, who was six at the time, she was having trouble sleeping. And so she would ask me to stay in the room while she fell asleep. And so I'd go read a book, and then I'd kind of hang out, I'd make a sketch, and in the morning I would show it to her. And I was making all of these reflection sketches at the beginning. And at the start she was like, oh, that's amazing, I'm hypnotized, that's so awesome. And then like a month in she was like, I think you need to do color. And so my, my six-year-old is my art director. So I woke up one day and I said, okay, I'm going to do color. And I started to do blobs. And I got really obsessed with these like blob forms and how, how would they move, how would they look. Um, blobs connected to blobs. I put myself in the blob. I don't know. She didn't like that. Um, and also get, I get inspired by designers and artworks around me. So uh, Lance Wyman, who is uh, also an AIGA medalist, like I love this, this offsets, like uh, taking a shape and just offsetting it. So I started, oh, sorry. I started with the blob saying like, how could, I, how could I take this shape and then just kind of make offsets from it and experiment with that or like blobs with offsets on top of blobs with offsets. Um, blob on blob action, that seems really interesting. Um, I love, like, I, I, I know, kind of don't like 3D graphics, but I like 3D graphics that look like 2D and 2D graphics that look like 3D. And I think it, they're interesting because your brain has to work harder. So you're, there's, I get really excited about these kind of, not like uh, optical illusions, but just very flat graphics, a flat graphical language. Um, and then a lot of times these sketches are responses to what I'm feeling. So around New Year's, I was, I, right after the election, I was feeling this weird energy, like, okay, it's New Year's, I should be happy, but like this election happened, I'm kind of sad, and uh, just trying to deal with the, the things that I'm feeling. Um, or like we went out and protested. My wife and I went to JFK and we were protesting the travel ban, and I just was feeling like, what is this energy of pushing? And so making sketches that are kind of responsive to the energy that I'm feeling. Um, or it was the anniversary of my father passing away, and I made a sketch that, um, where I was just thinking about walking and just the points. You can get these data sets of a walk cycle and just what it feels like to be walking and to be alone. Um, and then a lot of times I see things like the, um, on Instagram there are these, all these great videos of people doing calligraphy where they just film their hand kind of drawing stuff, and I thought about using those videos in a kind of algorithmic way. Um, a lot of times just doing stuff for, for uh, beauty's sake, just trying to make visual forms that excite me or interest me. Things like connecting half a circle with another half of circle and then extruding it out into space. Um, and then art, different artists I mentioned, but like Ruth Asawa is a sculptor who I really love. And I love the forms that she makes out of wire and trying to kind of take that energy and um, and revisit it, and like see what, what, how could I take that, those ideas and you know, apply that to the code that I'm writing. Um, I have done, I have about 1,500 sketches, so I'm not going to go through them all. Um, I will say the, the following. I, I have, I'm going to show you one thing, which is I have this one folder on my desktop. It's called Every Day. It's about 250 gigabytes. And this is, this is every, every thing I make goes in here. It's just kind of one place. And it's quite beautiful. This is not in chronological order. But it's quite beautiful to have this collection that as you're making, you just have this one place where you store all of the ideas, all the things that you go through. Um, and I have found this to be really, you know, it's a, di it's a diary. It's also, um, yeah, it's a way of understanding your creative process. I'm going to talk about one other thing that I started to do, and then I'm going to share an awesome book with you. And this is, um, Kind of in, also in related to those uh, sketches that I make, I, I started the same thing in New Year's, which is doing open office hours. So I make sketches every day, and that's my way of sort of saying hello to the world. 
And I was also thinking about how can I listen to the world? What is a good way to listen? And I was reminded of the printmaking studio. And I had this professor there who I really loved, Vinny Longo. And at 2 p.m. every day, he would open up the office to the printmaking studio. And he would take a muffin, this lemon poppy seed muffin. He would cut it into slices and invite the students to come in and talk to him. And I just love this idea of teachers taking students seriously and just listening. And he took me seriously. And I was telling him about all the things I was thinking about and working on. And he just listened and offered advice. And, and just that was a really important thing for me as a student. And so about a year and a half ago, I started this thing where I just kind of post online. I go on Twitter. I say, I'm going to have open office hours tomorrow for anybody, not just my students, but anybody who in the world. And I do them online. I do them offline. And I spend about three hours a week doing this and talking to people. And it's really beautiful. I do it on people contact me and call me on Skype. A lot of times they have questions about education or creative practice or technical problems that they're working on. Um, and I love it. Also, I see people when I'm traveling. Um, it's quite nice to, like, I'll be doing an install, like, and then you know, people will come and, and meet me. But I find this process really amazing. There, it seems like I'm doing this very selfless thing, but it's actually kind of selfish. I, if people email me, I was finding that I was spending so much time talking about talking and writing emails about meeting and having coffee. And it's quite nice to actually just, just not talk to anybody throughout the course of the week. I mean, I talk to my clients. I talk to my friends. But to actually say, like, come and find me. Come and see me during office hours. And I'm mentally prepared to listen. I'm alert. I'm, I'm able to talk to people. And I have found this process to be really beautiful and kind of um, important for me in my creative practice. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read you a book by uh, my stepdaughter, River. And this is an amazing book. Um, she's eight now. She was six when she made this. Um, the book is called I Am Art. I'm worried that soon she's going to start charging me royalties when I, <laughs> when I read this book. But let's see. Um, by River the Artist, I Am Art. Uh, this book is for Apo, Anagan, and Nana. Art. Art is like you feel free, you feel like you can do anything, and you know what to draw. And if you don't, you look at you. You are the one, and you have your own imagination. And maybe in your imagination, you will see lines and squares. This, this <laughs> took, me, <laughs> took me a long time to figure out. And in those squares and lines, you will see art. And that art is amazing, and you are too. Ha ha, hello, stop looking at me. Art, <laughs> art, art, art. Art. I am art. Art. Food is art. Art. Anything is art. 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 Thank you. Oh goodness, I like that a lot. So. I found that a lot of times when people ask me about my work, they, they ask me, like, how do you get all your ideas? Yeah. And I always find the, um, it's such a weird question, um, mm -hmm. and I, I, I have a feeling that you uh, might share this, um, because you seem to have ideas every moment, every, mm -hmm. so talk to me about, um, do you find that easy or hard? Is it, is it more just execution of ideas rather than the ideas? Yeah. I, mean, I think there's a couple of things, like one is, is to be a really kind of avid collector. I try to talk about this with my students in the school, um, and I try to model curiosity and just try to try to collect references and images and things that inspire you and mm -hmm. have those kind of ready available. And, and that's one, you know, that I think that if you do that, you have always have a starting point for things to, to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, a lot of times it's either kind of coming at it at a something that I want to see that I don't know how to make yet and try right. to figure it out. And that drives me crazy. Or, yeah. or, or just discovery and just playing. And I, I, I really just kind of jam and, and meditate with code and then see what happens. I like that concept of not knowing how, it's frustrating by not knowing how to do it. I used to, I have this saying that um, uh, stealing plus lack of talent equals creativity. So like the effort, which is the lack yeah. of talent is the least generous way to put this, but yeah. basically you don't know how to make the sculpture 
that yeah. you admire. Mm -hmm. And so in your effort to make it, you're going to come up with something completely new, even if you're not trying to make something new. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, so, so in all of this, you have this uh, sketches and you have these things that, uh, that where you can sort of operate on your own and speak to the world on your own, and you have this school, okay? Yeah. So, and that has all these great social and emotional things, but still you have to run a school, yeah. which is different than an art practice. Sure. <laughs> so can you talk about <laughs> what that is like? Yeah, so, um, for, well, to uh, back up for a sec, I do, I find it really helpful I do three things. One is uh, being an educator and also, I guess, an administrator. Um, the artistic practice and commercial work. And I have mm -hmm. this, I feel, think of them almost as three legs of a stool and try to figure out, they, they are really balanced for me and there's a lot of things that I bring from one to the other. And the connections I think are really interesting. In terms of the school, it's, it's um, super, hard work, it's really hard work. <laughs> um, when I was, I was an adjunct for a long time at Parsons, so what do adjuncts do? They just come, they show up, they teach. <laughs> Students have a problem, they complain, you're like, oh yeah, you know, it's the administration's fault. <laughs> yeah. But now, now I am the, the administration. administration. <laughs> yeah. So they complain is like very personal. Um, <laughs> but but it's, it's, it's really amazing. And I, actually, if there's any message that I wanna say is that you can, you can, start, you can start a school, you can start a community. If the community doesn't exist, we created this school because it didn't exist. This is the school that I would have liked to have five years ago or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, and you, if, that do, if the community that you want in your life doesn't exist, you can create it. Um, is there, if someone were to create a school, what is the sort of first thing, the lesson that you would have them keep in mind? Um, for us, it was really important to have a, write down a kind of mission statement and to mm -hmm. articulate our values. And I find that that's just generally helpful whenever we have to write anything or kind of do communication to, have, to be able to articulate your values. And we try to work in a very open source model. So for example, all of our, all of our finances are open. And you think about, you go to university, you have no idea where the money goes, right? Yeah. You don't know where your tuition goes. And we publish them on GitHub, you can see you know, we try to, the, that is one product of the values that we articulate. So. What is your mission statement? Is the openness the main thing? Um, yeah, the mission statement, I don't know what I'll say, it's on the website. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's but why it was, we write but it was down. about it was basically about, about um, celebrating weird, magical um, things that you can do with code, electronics, and theory. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, and, and trying to create a space that's not a boot camp. We were trying to make clear, because there are a lot of these 10-week programs where you go to learn to code. Right. And we're trying to make clear that this is more of a residency, that this is more of an artistic experience. Not everybody starting in one point and ending in one point, but everybody starting in different points. We do something on the first day of school, and usually a professor comes and gives you a syllabus. And the first day of school, we have everybody come and just take out a piece of paper and write down all of the questions that they have. Every question that they have and, and then they do that individually for 20, 30 minutes, then they come as groups, they collate the questions, and then we come up with this master list of questions. And we put them on the wall, we print them out, and they become, it, they become uh, starting points for discussion. They become starting points for, and some students are completionists, they wanna cross off, they wanna answer every question. Right. Some questions are completely unanswerable, uh -huh. and I, but I just love like the, you know, we start, we don't start with the answers, we start with questions. What kind of a student are you looking for? Like who, who comes, who, who is, who just, is in your student you, body? Just, uh, we just want students who are curious and work openly. Those are kind of the two values. And that who know how to code already or no, don't? No, no, yeah, no it all, doesn't matter. all levels. Wow. Yeah. Um, when you showed your work or the work of the students yeah. as um, code and result, is there one you view is the art result, or is the art the code, or is it both? Is it, it like I was? I found myself watching the code. Yeah, and yeah, and and it was amazing because we had we set it up at this film festival. We had many people just kind of watch the whole thing. The whole sequence is about forty minutes. And yeah, it's a bit like a code film festival, and and it yeah, I, it, I think both are important. And a lot of times you don't see the code, right? You, you interact with all of these applications all the time. You don't see the sort of underlying scaffolding, the thing that makes it. But I, I think that stuff is beautiful. Right? 
think do that's... you ever put the code on Instagram, like rather than the sketches? Would you ever uh, consider that? Oh, that's a good. That's really, yeah, maybe maybe I will. <laughs> I, haven't done, I haven't done that. I mean, I'd like to see yeah, it. Yeah. It's pretty. I mean, I just found it beautiful to watch you do it. Honestly, yeah. it's yeah. kind of there's something about that that's really yeah. peaceful. That was quick. my hands were shaking, so it's well, quite yeah. hard to do. <laughs> but, but yeah, it, yeah, it's peaceful, and I think it's, I. I think more it. I think artists should be more open about their process. When you actually see a lot of times, you just see these final results, right? And so, and especially a conference like this, is people showing projects, and it's like, here's like a home run, and another home run, another home run. <laughs> it's a bit like watching the highlights of a baseball game, right? But actually, there's so much of this kind of work and slogging and strikeouts and and just seeing that process. Yeah, trying to make that process more. Visible, I think, would be really helpful. That's great. Well, thank you so much. Please, yeah. um, thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.